The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John, in the first chapter, verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13 in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. And I want to take with that this morning the fifth and sixth verses in the eleventh chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, those who attend here regularly will realize the significance of the juxtaposition of those two verses from the 11th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, with the two verses in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. The basic statement is that statement in the prologue of John's Gospel, that to as many as received him gave he power to become the children of God. And that is our basic theme which we've been examining now for a number of months. And we're examining it from this standpoint that there is nothing more important for us in this world than to know that we are the children of God. There is that great statement. To as many as received it, he gave that a right to become the children of God. There's nothing higher than that. And the most important thing for us, therefore, I say, is to make sure and to make certain that we are the children of God. Now, we do so for two main reasons. We can't enjoy the Christian life unless we have this assurance. That's an obvious reason for making certain. But there's another, and indeed a much more important one. We cannot function truly as the children of God unless we are clear about our title deeds, unless we know who we are, and unless we are walking and living in this world as the children of God. Now, never was there a time when there was a greater need to realize this than just at this present time. We live in an evil world, and your business and mine is to show the world a better way, the way of God. And our responsibility is therefore a very great one. We mustn't just look at ourselves and consider our own states and conditions. We must be settled about that so that we can represent God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the world that is round and about us. You remember the description given of the Christian by the Apostle Paul in the second chapter of the epistle to the Philippians. He says that we are like lights in the heavens, in the firmament, and that our business is to hold forth the word of life in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation of people. That's the description of us at this present time, my friends crooked and perverse generation. It's obvious, isn't it? Very well, your business and mine is not simply to denounce the crookedness. It is to shine forth as lights in the heavens, as luminaries, showing a better way, a more glorious way. And to me, the first step in that is to be certain that we are the children of God. A Christian who is uncertain is of no value. He doesn't represent God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's uncertain. has to spend all his time looking at himself and thinking about himself, wanting some help for himself, not concerned about his responsibility to the world that is outside. I say, therefore, the first step is to be absolutely certain that we are the children of God. Now then, we've gone into the doctrine of this. We've looked at it, if you like, from the theoretical standpoint. And what we are now doing is we are looking at some examples of men and women like ourselves in this same world, having the same conditions to battle with and oftentimes even worse, but who nevertheless lived triumphantly and gloriously 
and bore their witness and their testimony to the truth of the things of God. In other words, we are now doing uh, what the author of the epistle to the Hebrews himself does in this 11th chapter. He was writing to give people assurance of salvation, and he's worked out his mighty doctrine in the first 10 chapters. But now he says, I want to help you. And he helps them by giving them these examples and illustrations out of the Old Testament. He says, these men, like ourselves, were the children of God. But look how they lived. Look how they triumphed. And what they did, you can do. They did it by faith. You must do it by faith in exactly the same way. Very well, and so he gives us this series of pictures and portraits of some of the notable Old Testament saints. Now, the thing that he emphasizes about them all is the thing he says in the second verse. By it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Witness was born unto them that God was well pleased with them. That's his secret, he says. That's the secret of every one of them. Now, we've already examined this in the case of Abel, and we saw how the truth concerning him is brought out in particular by contrasting him with his brother Cain. Now, there we saw the importance of being quite certain as to the way in which we approach God. There is only one way. We have to take the right offering. We have to rely only upon our Lord and his perfect atoning work on our behalf. Very well, we've looked at that. But now we come along this morning and we look at a second case. The second case that he gives us, the case of Enoch. I indicated last Sunday morning in dealing with the case of Abel that we mustn't think that every one of these cases is identical with all the others. Fundamentally, of course, it's the same thing. It's faith. But in each particular instance, there is some peculiar aspect or angle of the matter that is brought out in a particular manner. And therefore, as we come to look at this case of Enoch, we shall find that there is something taught us here which wasn't taught us with the same fullness as we were dealing with the case of Abel. Now, there are some three main references to Enoch in the Bible. Let me hurriedly remind you of them so that we shall be clear about the historical aspect of this matter. And indeed, it is very important that we should do so if we are to learn the lesson truly. The first reference is in the fifth chapter of the book of Genesis in verses 21 to 24. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. There is the historical detail that we are given with regard to Enoch. Then there is this reference here in Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6. And there is furthermore that reference to him which we saw there in the epistle of Jude at the beginning, in verses 14 and 15, where we read, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, namely of the evil that was going to come, that is like the raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame, etc. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh, with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Very well. There are the facts as we have given them concerning Enoch. Now here is a surely a most important case. And you see how up to date the scripture is. Don't forget that Enoch lived in those terrible, horrible days before the flood. The days of Sodom and Gomorrah. The days, the days before the flood, rather. These awful, dissolute, evil, sinful days that are described in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis 
and which we hope to deal with, God willing, next Sunday morning in greater detail. But that was the period. He lived in that age that led to the judgment of the flood, when men gave themselves to sin and evil and vice of every description. Yet what we are told about this man is that he lived and walked with God and was well-pleasing in God's sight. So much so that we are told that he was translated, that he never saw death. He was one of the two men that never died in the usual manner. The other is, of course, the prophet Elijah. He was translated that he should not see death. He was taken by God. How, we don't know. We are not told. But he was. He didn't have to die a natural death. Obviously, his body was changed in some manner that we can't understand. But he was taken as he was, as Elijah was taken, immediately to the presence of God and to heaven. Now, that's not the thing that's going to concern us this morning. But it is, of course, a notable and a remarkable thing. Incidentally, it shows us the importance of the doctrine of the resurrection of the body and that we must never surrender that. We don't merely go on as spirits. The whole man is to be saved. The body is to be redeemed as well as the soul and spirit. However, I say that isn't the thing that must uh, keep us this morning. The important thing about this case of Enoch is this, as this man reminds us, that before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, that's the thing. It is true that Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. But the secret of the men, the reason ultimately why that did happen to him and why he was spared the agony and the suffering of death and all that is involved in the dissolution of the body, the ultimate reason for that is that he had this testimony that he pleased God. That was the secret of this man, Enoch. Now, that is the thing to which I'm calling attention. As I say, the common factor to all these people who are mentioned in this chapter is just that. They were given the knowledge, the certain knowledge, that they were well-pleasing to God. They were given a testimony. You remember it in the case of Abel. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. That's the thing. He, he was given to know that God was pleased with his gift. He wasn't uncertain. He was given the assurance so that before he was murdered by his brother, he was rejoicing in this assurance of his relationship to God. And in the same way, we are told of Enoch. Before he was translated, he had this testimony that he pleased God. In other words, he is, you see, the second instance and example that this man gives of a man who enjoyed full assurance of salvation. And the importance of that for us is this. It was because he enjoyed this that he was able to live as he did in his day and generation, amidst the sin and the vice and the evil of that pre-deluge world. This man stood out as a light in the heavens. He rejoiced in his relationship to God, and he was a rebuke to all the ungodliness that was rampant round and about him. Very well. You see the obvious importance of considering such a case. Now, the first thing that arises, therefore, for our consideration is this. How exactly was he given this testimony that he pleased God? We are told that he was given it. I incidentally... I would entirely disagree at this point with the interpretation of this by the great Dr. John Owen, who says that the testimony is the testimony that's given to him in the Scripture. But the Scripture tells us that the testimony was given him before his translation, and the Scriptures were not written until some considerable period of time afterwards. No, no, this isn't that merely, this testimony is not the mere record of him in the Scripture. He was given it, as all these men were given it. It's something personal, it's something subjective, it is in the realm of assurance of salvation. How did he receive this, I ask? How was he given this testimony that he pleased God? Well, I have no hesitation in answering that question in this way. The answer, I suggest, is found 
in what we are told about him in Genesis 5 verse 24. And Enoch walked with God. What does that mean? Well, I'm going on to show you later that it means the way, the manner in which he walked. But there's something much more important than that. And it is this. Enoch knew that he was walking with God. God gave Enoch the privilege of his companionship. Enoch knew that he was walking in the presence of God. He knew God. God was his companion. And God made it quite clear to him that he loved him, that he was well pleased with him, and that he was a man after his own heart. Now, we are told about Abram that he was the friend of God. That's over and above believing in God. So is walking with God. The whole picture is of two companions walking along a road together, each one conscious of the presence of the other. That's, that's the very notion that is conveyed. And I'm suggesting, therefore, that uh, God made it clear to Enoch that he was well pleased with him by letting him know that he was with him, giving him intimations of his nearness and of his presence speaking to him in different ways, blessing him in certain manners, giving him this intimate, personal realization that he was there. I've quoted before, I think, the statement of an old Puritan of the name of Bolton in the 17th century. He quotes a man who, dying, left this as his dying message to men and women. God dealeth familiarly with men. And he does. That's the story that you get of the patriarchs. God came down as it were and spoke to them. They knew they had a direct, immediate knowledge, which is the height of assurance, as we've already seen. And Enoch is a perfect instance of that. Enoch walked with God. Over and above his faith, he had this absolute certainty. As God gave the same certainty, you remember, to Jacob that night when he was there at Peniel, so he did to Enoch and in a much more striking manner, possibly, so that a man is able to say, this is the house of God. This is the gateway of heaven. God is here. That's the kind of thing to which I'm referring. You get many instances of that in the Old Testament. Very well, then, I say that he was given this testimony in that manner. God let him know that he was pleased with him. And God did so by giving him these manifestations of himself and these intimations of his good pleasure in him. Very well, my friends, the question we ask ourselves, therefore, is this. Do we know anything about that? Do we know anything about walking with God? Do we know anything of God bearing us testimony that he's well pleased with us? Has he given us these intimations? This is the important thing. We can't function, I say truly, as Christians in this evil hour unless we have this very thing. Now, you notice my argument. I'm not here to denounce those who are outside this morning. That's a very simple and an easy thing to do. But that isn't the ultimate business of the church. The church is to show and to manifest this other way. Mere denunciation of evil gets you nowhere. It's obvious, it's easy, it's cheap. I've no doubt a great deal of that will be done today, but it will be of no value to anybody at all. What the world needs to know is this, that it's possible for a man to walk with God even in this evil world as it is today. That's the thing that we must look for. We can feel very happy as Pharisees and we say, thank God I'm not like that man. But that's sheer Pharisees, my friend. The question for you is this, not are you unlike that man, but are you like Enoch? The need of the hour is a church filled with men and women like Enoch who walk with God. That's the way to reform the church and the world. And any concentration on negatives alone will get us nowhere. Very well, let's proceed to consider this man. What was his secret? The answer is given in the sixth verse, which is, of course, an obvious commentary on verse 5. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, to please God. Enoch did please God. He was given the testimony that he had. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now then, what were the secrets of Enoch? Well, the first thing is obviously his faith. His faith. 
This is always vital. But it's interesting to notice the way in which this man puts it here. He says, he that cometh to God. Now what does that mean? That's the most important phrase. He that cometh to God. It's a, a phrase that this man is rather fond of. He's already used it at, in the 10th chapter in the first verse. For the law, he says, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The comers thereunto perfect. He's dealing with the whole question of how a man is to approach God. How a man has access in worship into the presence of the everlasting and eternal God. Or, if you like, let me give you another phrase which indicates the same thing. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. By whom also we have access, access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But the thing is, the access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, that's coming unto God. He that cometh unto God. He who has access to God and is able to stand before him in grace. He that cometh unto God. Now that's the meaning of the phrase. It means access to God and his favor. It means access or approach to God in worship. So he that cometh to God is a man who is anxious to have this access into the presence of God. This is the biggest thing in his life. He doesn't just come to church mechanically and feel he's done his good day's deed. Wonderful. He goes to church. These other people don't. No, no. He that cometh to God, that he may know him, that he may have access, that he may stand before him and have fellowship and communion. That's the connotation. He that cometh to God. So you see, this is the first thing we've got to concentrate on. That was the great characteristic of Enoch. He lived for that. That was life to Enoch. Coming to God. Entering into the presence. Is it the chief thing with us, my friends? Very well, we are therefore faced with the question, how does one truly come to God? Really make sure that you've arrived, that you're in the holiest of all, and that you're speaking to God and God is speaking to you. You're having this access, this fellowship. How does it happen? And the answer is given, and it's the most important one. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, there is no statement in the scripture, I think, that is more frequently misunderstood than this. It's generally taken like this. He that cometh to God, if a man's going to say his prayers, well, it's obvious. This is how it's interpreted. The author is saying it's quite obvious. You can't pray to God unless you believe in the existence of God. And you can't really pray to God unless you believe that God is prepared to reward you for your goodness. He that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Elementary, obvious, first principles. Don't pray to God if you don't believe in the being of God. Well, obviously, if you pray, you must believe in the existence, in the being of God. And you must believe, furthermore, that if you live a good life and please him, God will reward you. In other words, you see, uh, the popular interpretation today is the popular notion of Christianity today. A Christian is a man who believes in God and who believes that if he lives a good life, God will be well pleased with him and he'll go to heaven. You believe in God and you believe that God is love. That's all. There's no more necessary. Quite simple. Believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But it's a very simple thing indeed to show that not only that that is wrong, but that it is an actual blank contradiction of what this man's teaching. It's a contradiction of the whole of his epistle. It is a contradiction of the whole of the teaching of the whole Bible. That isn't what it means at all. There is a much bigger and deeper and fuller connotation. The chapter is about faith. 
the faith of these men of God, the faith that these Hebrew Christians were to have, in the light of all the great doctrine that he's been expounding. What is faith? Faith is this. Faith is finally an acceptance and a submission to the revelation of God. That is faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How do we know about the things God has revealed them? And you accept the revelation. Very well then, so let's go on with a positive interpretation. He must believe, faith means first then, that a man believes that God is. He must believe that God is. Now, here is the crucial phrase, of course. You see, when he says that he must believe that God is, and you can only do that, he says, by faith, he is contrasting faith with speculation. That's the contrast that's here. It isn't speculation. Oh, there are many people speculating about God. They're writing books. God's not up there, not out there. God is depth. That's sheer speculation. Nothing like that in the scriptures. This is men, modern men, having come of age. He now is discovering God, as it were. He's giving a new description of God. That's sheer speculation. That's the antithesis of what we are told about Enoch. You see, that was the whole trouble, wasn't it, with those people whom the Apostle Paul was speaking to in Athens. You remember how we are told that at Athens he addressed the Stoics and the Epicureans. And it's most interesting to notice what he said to them. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious, too religious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. That's the contrast. You see these Athenians, Stoics, Epicureans, typical philosophers, they had a notion that there was some ultimate being behind all their gods and behind all phenomena, and they were seeking if happily they might seek after him and find him, speculating, putting up his theories and postulates and examining, and arguing and debating and wrangling. Look here, says Paul, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Whom ye ignorantly worship, the unknown God, you don't know him, I'm declaring him to you. That's the contrast. In other words, faith means the acceptance of the revelation that God has given of himself. You see, Paul as a Jew was able to say to those Athenians, I'm a Jew, we've got the oracles of God. We are not left with speculation and our own reason and understanding. God has revealed himself. God has manifested himself. He's chosen this nation of the Jews to give the revelation. And we have it written. We have the oracles of God. I'm not theorizing. I'm telling you what God has manifested concerning himself to men and to the nation and all he's done with that nation and his purpose. Revelation. That's what it means. But that is only the beginning of what it means. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. Now surely there is a very profound and deep meaning here. This is surely a reference to that peculiar revelation which God gave of himself to Moses and through him to the children of Israel. Let me read the relevant passage to you. God had been giving revelations of himself. To the patriarchs, we've seen it already, in the, to Adam even, then to Abel, then to Enoch, Noah and others. But a point came when he gave a very special revelation of himself to Moses. And let me read to you therefore out of Exodus chapter 3, where I read this. In verse 13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. I am. Then let's notice the commentary which is given us on that 
in the sixth chapter of the book of Exodus, beginning at the second verse, and God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abram, and to Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, that's to say, I am that I am, was I not known to them. Now here is a very peculiar and special revelation of God as he gave it to the children of Israel just before he was going to lead them out of the captivity of Egypt and take them to their promised land. He reveals himself as, I am, that I am. If you like, I shall be what I shall be. It's everything. I always was, I always shall be. I am, God is. And this is the peculiar name, Jehovah, that he always uses about himself when he wants to bring out his covenant relationship to his people. That's why he did it at that particular juncture. Tell them that I am hath sent me, the God who has pledged himself to you the God whose people you are, the God who is going to bring you to your promised land. Now, then, what we are told here, therefore, here is this, that the first element in faith is that it believes that God is, that he is the everlasting and eternal God, the God who has revealed himself to his people in covenant language and in covenant form and who has a certain purpose with respect to them. Faith believes that it submits to it. It says I'm not interested in what the latest philosopher has said or the latest speculation of some clever fellow. No, no. All I know about God is what I have in this book. Here is God's revelation. I submit utterly, absolutely. That's what Enoch did. And that is what all who have faith must of necessity do. So that you see. The man of faith doesn't say, oh, well, of course, now we're in 1963. We no longer believe in God up there, Father. That's Victorian. No, no. Now, we, of course, we've got to think now in scientific. The moment a man speaks like that, I don't hesitate to say about him, he is not a man of faith. He's a speculating philosopher. He may call himself a Christian. We can't stop him doing that, but he's not a Christian. A Christian is a man of faith. He believes that God is what he has revealed himself to be. He knows nothing apart from this revelation. That's the first thing. But then he adds to that, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What does this mean? Well, again, it doesn't just mean that God is love and that God is kind. He is that, but it means much more than that. You see, here in this phrase is again the whole content about the way of salvation. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You get adumbrations of this in the Old Testament. With thee, says the psalmist, there is mercy that thou mayest be feared. How did he know that? Did he just sit down and say, God must be a God of love? I can't conceive of a God who isn't prepared to forgive everybody and send everybody to heaven at the end. No, no, that's speculation again. With thee there is mercy that thou mayest be feared. How does he know it? He knows it because of the revelation. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do I know that? Is it because I think it must be true because God is love? No, that's not the basis. It's because God has said so. All these statements of the Old Testament with regard to God's character, that's what we have before us here. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is the great theme of the whole of the Bible. This is the thing that the men of the Old Testament lived by. They didn't see it as clearly as you and I should see it. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, says our Lord. He saw it afar off and was glad. We are told that indeed about all these men at the end in verse 39. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Or indeed we are told very specifically about them uh, earlier in this chapter that these men didn't see these things. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. In other words, All these Old Testament saints 
had believed the revelation that God had given concerning his purpose of salvation. That's what this means. I reminded you last Sunday how he first announced it in the Garden of Eden. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. It's all right, he said. There is going to be a conflict. Seed of the woman, seed of the serpent. Life's going to be difficult. Thorns, briars, trouble, struggle. It's all right. But, he says, I'm giving you the promise. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. It's going to involve his being bruised in his heel. Doesn't matter. There's the great promise. The purpose of God in salvation. And he goes on unfolding it. We saw in the case of Abel. The blood sacrifice had been revealed. And there it is again. And on and on it goes. Now that's the thing that is meant by that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, God at the very dawn of history made a proclamation. He gave a revelation. He addressed men in sin the moment he had fallen and he gave him a kind of preview of history. And he said, you know, there's going to be a great division. God pronounced judgment upon sin. He says he's a holy God and that he cannot wink at sin. He denounces sin. He's going to punish sin. Perfectly clear. But he then gives this offer of salvation. He announces his purpose of redemption. And the two things run right through the whole of the Bible. Now, we have that specific statement of Jude to the effect that God had made this quite clear and that Enoch believed it. Listen, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch believed that statement of God. He believed that God is going to judge the world in righteousness and punish sinners by banishment out of his sight eternally everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. But he also believed the message of salvation and he gave himself to it. He believed that God is. This covenant God, this God of the promise, this God of the purpose, this God of the way of salvation, he believed the two sides, judgment and redemption, and he submitted himself to it. That's what he believed. That's what faith means. He must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, he submits himself utterly, absolutely, to the revelation of God and his gracious purpose. He trusted God's word utterly and based the whole of his life upon it. That's the first thing. But you notice that he adds to that. He talks here about his diligently seeking God. Without faith, You can't begin. Nothing can be done at all. That's why the world by wisdom knew not God. Didn't exercise faith. It didn't believe the revelation. Faith is the beginning. It's essential. But in addition, there were these further things about this man Enoch that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, our authorized translation here is right. It's good. The New English Bible, so called, puts it uh, that uh, God is uh, rewarded, if I remember rightly, of those who search for him. It's much more than searching for him, diligently seeking. There's something special about this. There is the whole notion of taking trouble to find him out and to be constantly doing so. You see, the Christian is not just the man who says, oh, yes, I believe in God. I've always believed in God. I've always brought up to believe in God. Of course I believe. I never go to a place of worship if I believe in God. I say my prayers. That's not Christianity. Diligently seek him. He not only knows how to seek him, but he goes on doing it. The whole secret of Enoch, in a sense, was just this. That uh, while so many were godless and vile and evil round and about him in that ancient world. He believed in God and lived a fairly good life. That's not Christianity. That's not the child of God in any age or dispensation. No, no. He diligently sought him. He didn't just say, of course, I couldn't dream of doing things like that. I can't join. And then just live a nice little quiet, respectable life and 
say, I believe in God, and uh, this is my kind of life. No, no. He diligently sought him. He sought God because he enjoyed God. Because he wanted fellowship with God. He didn't dismiss God in five minutes in the morning, reading a little portion of scripture and a comment on it and a little prayer, and say, I've done my daily portion, I'm right with God, and then go on and think no more about God. No, no, he sought him. He wanted to realize his presence. He was diligently looking for him, always, everywhere, at all times. This was the big central thing in his life. He diligently sought him. He wasn't happy when he lost the sense, the conscious sense of the presence of God. My friends, that's what we are to enjoy. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, the children of God. And the child has access to the father's presence when servants are not allowed. He's always ready to receive the child, and the child wants to be there, and he wants to be near his father, and he isn't happy when he's away. Diligently seek him. This was the big thing in the life of Enoch. He wasn't happy when he wasn't enjoying this active, full, conscious presence of God. So he sought him out diligently. He was always seeking him. He was always turning to him in thought, in meditation, and in prayer. It was the whole tenor of his life. And then the third thing we are told about him is that, which I've quoted from the fifth chapter of Genesis, he walked with God. You see, the full life of faith is described here. You get the whole basis in faith. You get this devotional aspect, this experimental aspect in experience, experiential aspect, I should call it. And then thirdly, you get this practical outworking. Enoch walked with God. Over and above uh, his enjoying the companionship and having the intimation, he tells us a great deal about the type of life he was living. You see, the fact about Enoch was that he always realized that he was walking in the presence of God. And that is what walking with God means. Let me divide it up to you as John actually divides it for us in his first epistle and in the first chapter. John, again, you see, writes to these people to give them assurance. He says, these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Well, how are you to get this full joy? Listen, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So the man who walks with God is the man who's always reminding himself of that. He's a man who says, wherever I go, God is. I can never go out to the presence of God, work it out in terms of Psalm 139, if I go to heaven, take the wings of the morn, make my bed in hell, doesn't matter, depths of the sea, God is everywhere. The man who walks with God is a man who reminds himself of that and is conscious of that. Because he can go and do things in secret and men and women won't see him. His wife won't see him. His cabinet colleagues won't see him. God sees him. And he knows that he's always everywhere in the presence of God. And he knows that God is light and that in him is no darkness at all. So he is a man who walks, I say, in that consciousness, and his chief desire is to please God, to keep God's laws, and thereby to be well-pleasing in God's sight. He knows that God has told us that he it is that loveth me that keepeth my commandments, that love is not an empty sentiment, Love is that which keeps the commandments of God. If you love a person, you want to please that person. If you love God, you want to please God. You please God by keeping his commandments. The man who walks with God and who wants to do so is a man, therefore, who does his utmost to keep the commandments of God. Or to put it, put it negatively, he avoids everything that displeases God. Listen to John again, 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. 
You can't say that you are walking with God if in the meantime you are walking in darkness, the thing's impossible. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So if you're walking with God, you're not walking in the darkness, you're walking in the light. If you say that you are in fellowship with him and walking in darkness, you're a liar. You're deceiving yourself. You're not deceiving God. You're deceiving yourself. And if you're a true man of God, you don't want to do that. Or another way, as John puts it in the second chapter, in verses 15 to 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We know what they are, don't we? They've been plastered before us this last week. Papers, television, love not the world, the clever world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Very well, he avoids these things. He hates the world because he loves God, and he wants to be well-pleasing in his sight. And should he inadvertently fall into sin, he is grieved, he is heartbroken. Do you heal yourselves lightly when you fall into sin, my friends, or does it grieve you that you've sinned against this God who so loved you as to send his only son to die for you? Does it grieve you? Does it get you down? It should, but you don't remain on the ground. You go on and say in 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we are fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. He believes that. He believes further that if we confess our sins, he who is, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he doesn't say, I've ceased to be a Christian. I might as well give up. He says, no, I'll go back to him. I'll go to my father. And he confesses it and he accepts and believes that he's completely forgiven and cleansed anew and afresh. And he gets up and he goes on walking with God in the light. That was the secret of Enoch. As it has always been the secret of every child of God in every age and generation. Is it ours, my friends? Do we know God? Do we know what it is to walk consciously with God? Is this the height of our ambition? Is this our greatest concern? To enjoy his companionship, to be well-pleasing in his sight? Whatever the world may do or say, this. That was the whole secret of this man, Enoch. And it was because he was like that that God translated him. I rather like the way an old Welsh preacher used to put this. His way of putting it was like this. Here was this man Enoch, he said, walking with God. Every day he'd go and look for God and they'd have a walk together. And then God would say, well, I must leave you now. You go home and sleep. Get up in the morning and do your work and I'll look out for you again tomorrow. And this was the life that Enoch lived. This was his greatest delight. He had his work to do, of course. But the thing he always looked for was when he could specially give himself utterly and absolutely to walk, taking a walk with God and enjoying his companionship and fellowship. And he'd been doing this, as we are told in the record, for several hundred years. And he was enjoying it every day. And one day he went as usual. He'd finished his work. And he went to the meeting place. And there was God waiting for him. And they walked together and it was wonderful. God had never been so loving. God had never been so kind. And Enoch had never been so happy. But the time came, the usual time, for God to say, Very well, I must leave you at that for today and we'll meet again tomorrow. But God didn't say that on this occasion. He said, Enoch, we've been doing this now so long together. You enjoy it. I enjoy it. 
I'm not going to say to you tonight what I've generally said. Go home and rest and sleep and get up and do your work and look for me tomorrow. Enoch, he said, come with me. Don't go home, come with me. So he took him. He was not. God took him to his everlasting habitation. The perpetual fellowship was to be absolute. There was never to be another break or another intermission. All right, it was an old preacher's imagination. But you know, there's a profound truth in it. You and I should have such an intimate knowledge of God that it really more or less comes to that. And what is death? Well, then death, you see, just becomes this. That God says to us, all right, I'm not going to leave you in this old world any longer. Come along. Come to me permanently. Come into the everlasting habitation that my beloved son has prepared for you. Come home. Come with me. And be with me for the remainder of eternity. For everlasting life. For endless living in my presence. Come home. Very well, my friend. What a life. What a glorious life. The secret of that, to live like that and to die like that, is to be like this man Enoch. You walk by faith with the God whose presence and companionship you seek above everything else. And he'll let you know that you are well-pleasing in his sight, that you are his child, and that, or soon or late, He will just take you home. And then you'll say, forever with the Lord. Amen. So let it be. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.